And we're looking forward to, uh, to this summit. So, uh, Joanna, okay. it is good to have you. Thank you. Well, we thank you guys so much for hosting us here. And uh, we need to give a huge round of applause to Jennifer Drago for putting this all together and her support, Courtney. So truly how we were able to bring this together, we got a grant through Maricopa County, which has been amazing, and it was some COVID dollars. Because, raise your hand, who was prepared for COVID to hit back in 2020? Right? Nobody. Like, w there was no playbook for it. We didn't know what was going to happen. And so I kept on thinking, like, we really need to bring this together, all these emergency preparedness, and know our resources. So God forbid a fire happens or a flood happens or something, like, we know our resources. But for Benavia, if you are a caregiver, come to us for resources. We have a variety of resources we can give you. We have respite in our life enrichment programs. We have an amazing Benefitness Adaptive Gym. If you haven't been to tour it, please come over to our Adaptive Gym. We do free home services for people who can't drive anymore in our communities. So if you know someone that's not comfortable driving anymore, we have volunteers who will take them to doctor's appointments. They'll go grocery shopping for them. They'll be a friendly visitor or handyman work. Or if you want to volunteer in that area or anywhere in Benavia, we would truly appreciate it. Because it really does. It takes a village to make sure that everybody can have an enriched life. So with that, enjoy your day today learn a lot of different resources, and we're open to any questions or ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so as we get started, I think each of you have a program, which I don't. I think I've handed mine out, but um, on the program, you'll notice that we have, thanks, Joanne. <laughs> on the inside, on the right side, we have um, the speakers who you'll be hearing from today, but I just wanted to point out, if you haven't had a chance to Go to a, see our resource tables in the CLC. Somebody's going to have to tell me what that stands for. <laughs> uh, the ten, at 10.45, we will have a break, a quick 15-minute break, so you can start to visit some of those table vendors. And then at noon, the vendors, the tables will still be open, so you will have plenty of chances to go grab the resources. And on the left side of your program, you'll see all the different organizations that are here today, and I'm going to highlight a few of the vendors and what they're giving out um, throughout this, but I actually, Joanne mentioned Benavia, and I really wanted to highlight one of the goals of today is to help you connect with resources that can benefit you, your loved ones, your neighbors, and if anybody that you know has any kind of need as it relates to their home, their um, personal health, um, staying independent. Benavia has a great resource line, it's called CARES, and they will help you identify a resource that can help with, with anything that you or neighbors need. So um, that's my first resource um, connection for you. You might also notice today we are videotaping um, all of the presentations, and I know many of you work with volunteer, you volunteer for different organizations in the Sun Cities area, Surprise, et cetera. If you have an interest in using these presentations or having them available through a website or at a meeting that you want, please get in contact with me and um, I would be happy to help make those available. That is why we're videotaping them is because we want them to have wider distribution than even today. Okay, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and invite our very first two speakers up to the stage, if I could. Um, Cecilia Velo Velos, I, I probably messed that up, I'm sorry, is uh, with the American Red Cross. Oh, you can stay right here oh. since you're speaking first. And then Stephanie Miller is with the Arizona Statewide Independent Living Council. So I'm going to introduce Cecilia first, and then Stephanie, let them both give their presentations, and then we'll have time for Q&A with both of them. So Cecilia is currently a disaster program specialist at the American Red Cross, and she serves, and the uh, ARC serves Maricopa, Gila, and Pinal counties, focusing, well, they serve all counties, but that's Cecilia's job, or those three counties, focusing on preparedness education, disaster response, and disaster recovery. Cecilia holds a bachelor's degree in social work and a master's degree in emergency management and homeland security. She was inspired to pursue a career that focuses on empowering resilience, what today is all about, in individuals, families, and communities after volunteering with AmeriCorps after Hurricane Sandy. 
And Stephanie, who will speak right after Cecilia, is the Disability and Emergency Preparedness Equity Educator for the Arizona Statewide Independent Living Council. She entered the world of emergency management in 2015, working for the Maricopa County Department of Emergency Management. And knowing that our parts of our community are disproportionately affected by disasters, she utilized her bachelor's in justice studies to strive for inclusion in emergency management, especially for those who have disabilities. She then accepted this position at the Arizona Statewide Independent Living Council, where she continues to bridge the gap between emergency management professionals and the disability community. So we're so pleased to have both of these speakers here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Cecilia to tell us a little bit more about the, Arizona, or the American Red Cross. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about Red Cross as just kind of the big organization of what we do and then I'll kind of tailor it down to what it looks like that we do here locally within Maricopa County and also within Sun Cities um, and all West Valley cities. So the mission of the American Red Cross is to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of our donors. A lot of our uh, funding comes through the donations that we receive. When people donate, they can um, put it towards maybe one big, huge disaster that might have just occurred, or they can kind of put it in the big bucket of money for Red Cross to use as needed to service the clients and the communities that we're, we're helping out after big emergencies. In 2023, the climate crisis took a devastating toll on families in our country it sparked a record number of billion dollar disasters. But people like you answered the call to help through the American Red Cross. Your support made our life-saving mission possible. You helped provide shelter, food, and hope. Someone with a Red Cross jacket on came to the area where my parents used to live and actually paid attention. Those little things, those are tangible things that make a difference. Because you don't know what you got till it's gone. On behalf of those we serve, thank you. We are grateful for your support. All right. So as I mentioned, Red Cross, it's a huge organization. And American Red Cross is within the United States. We do have Red Crescent that services other countries. And a part of all of that, our big parent organization is the International Federation of Red Cross. So we've put out humanitarian services all over the world. Um, here in the US, we also not only have the disaster relief part of things that we do, um, but we also have blood that people, we receive donations, give it out to the hospitals, and then people can have those blood transfusions as needed. Uh, training services, we offer training in um, babysitting courses in uh, aquatics and um, hands-only CPR, AED, and you can get certifications for those. And that's for adults, children, babies as well. And then we have uh, services we provide to the service um, of the armed forces. So Red Cross provides critical assistance and resources to service members, veterans, and their families. And then we also have our international services. So with the international services, um, the Global Red Cross and Red Crescent, as I had mentioned, um, that whole network, they support our partners in responding to and recovering from disasters and building healthier communities. And every day we have an impact across the US, which is great. So 170 times a day, we help a family affected by a disaster. You'll see in one of the next slides that that is one of the most common disasters that we have nationwide it happens within like every seven minutes or eight minutes we're responding to a home fire and a lot of times people may be displaced from their homes it could be temporary and it could be for a longer period of time the fire department gives us a call and we respond and we'll have a team go out and provide some services some um, comfort items and then financial assistance if people are being displaced from their home for a period of time uh, we also have um 1,500 times a day, uh, we provide services to military families. 1,300 times a day, wait, 13,000 times a day, um, a person receives life-saving Red Cross training. And we have apps that I'll go ahead and show as well. And with that, you'll, we've already put out a million uh, weather alerts 
that the Red Cross has sent to let people know about hazards in their community that may be something that we're monitoring or fast approaching hazards. Hazards that we do face, like you'll see, is home fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, floods. A lot of the most common ones that we experience here in Arizona are wildfires, of course, extreme heat, um, and then flooding, home fires, and winter storms in more of the northern area, and then thunderstorms that come along, especially during monsoon season. So the odds are that disasters will strike. Uh, they happen often and sometimes without warning. Um, they can affect any community, so it doesn't matter who we are, where we came from, they happen, and we have to figure out how to prepare ourselves and also how the community is going to respond in that effort. So they always say the first 72 take care of you because um, all of the first responders are going to be very overwhelmed with trying to meet the needs of the community, assessing the situation and developing any sort of plans that we need to locate places to put people in safe, um, to get them safely uh, in a shelter or in a um, safe environment of whatever that, whatever that looks like. So um, we typically see disasters overwhelm response systems, people are hurt and then um, buildings, property is usually damaged or destroyed, which is when people are displaced. So we do help um, with disasters, big and small. Sometimes we are out for a very long time um, when it comes to like the Hawaii wildfire that we recently experienced. Many people from the Red Cross that are on the mainland went out there to volunteer and they were out there for at least three weeks or longer. And some of them didn't have, you know, comfort living situations, but they were there to help and to get people the services that they needed. A lot of those folks ended up in hotels. So the hotels were, you know, totally packed with families, their pets, and we provided any sort of comfort and items that we needed. We worked with our community partners to provide hot meals, snacks, water, and we do damage assessments. So then we can figure out what sort of financial assistance we can provide to those families. So we are there in some of the darkest moments. So we provide uh, the basic needs like food and shelter, cleanup supplies and comfort items. So we'll have cleanup kits we bring out, depending on the type of disaster, it may be tarps, it may be um, a whole bucket full of like gloves, um, safety gear and cleaning products. It could be shovels and the, yeah, I don't know, the world's your oyster with that one. It just depends on the disaster. Um, and then financial assistance, health and mental health care is also provided through um, our trained volunteers. Many of them may be already licensed counselors. Um, we have licensed nurses. So they also step up to help us with the needs of our clients that we're serving. And like I had mentioned, home fires are one of the most common um, disasters that we respond to. So every day, seven people die in U.S. home fires. Uh, as responders, we wanted to change the odds, and that's why we launched our Sound the Alarm program. So we have already installed two mil over 2 million um, new smoke alarms and responded to almost a, a million um, home f households that we've made safer, actually. So we also monitor any sort of um, smoke alarms that we install into people's homes and then we're able to get reports that show which of those homes actually did have a home fire and we can see how many people lived in that home and the impact we were able to make by getting there early putting in those smoke alarms before that fire happened so that way they were properly alerted it's very common that some people don't have any smoke alarms in their home maybe they have one or two that still work but in the um in the in the desert out here where we live, it's best to do a, a, get a new um, smoke alarm between eight to 10 years because the sensors inside of those smoke alarms can gather that dust and they'll be less effective over time. Um, people don't often check their smoke alarm, so it's good to do that at least once a month. If you can't reach it because it's way high up on the ceiling, I always suggest using a broomstick and just poking that button it's gonna alert everybody in the home, but that's how you know that it's working. So as I mentioned with the sound the alarm, uh, we do big events and then we also do um, appointment requests that we'll go out to. So um, we do have a QR code on this PowerPoint that you can scan with your camera and then it'll take you to the page where you can just insert your information online with just your name, your address, time of day and days of the week that would work best for you. And then we will go ahead and notify our volunteers 
and they will go into your homes and they will do those smoke alarm installations. Upon request, we also do bed shaker um, installation, so that way it will be alerted by the smoke alarm that is going off, and it will put a it'll um, begin vibrating, and it's typically under a person's pillow, and so then that way they can feel it and they can wake up. These are for people who have somebody in the home or multiple people in the home who are deaf and hard of hearing. We'll provide this service as well. So, how the American Red Cross supports your community. Our local chapter office is in the Biltmore area, so it is off of Camelback Road and 22nd Street in Phoenix. We participate every year in exercises that are hosted by our local jurisdictions and the municipalities to improve any sort of planning for real world events. The exercises will focus on power outages, wildfires, floods, mass casualty incidents, uh, nuclear release from Palo Verde Generating Station, and the list goes on and on with those. We take um, into consideration vulnerable populations, emergency evacuations that lead from a short term to more of like a long ter term um, shelter operation. Uh, transportation plans in case there's people in the community that might not have transportation access, then we'll make sure if we need to um, find some local resources or if we need to partner with Valley Metro and call them and they will come out and help get people to a safe location. Uh, we also take into consideration household pets and livestock. We will find a place where um, livestock can go and typically the pets are either co-located there at our shelter facilities or um, we'll have another location and the Arizona Humane Society helps us with the pets. Um, and so we do collaborate with community partners to learn about resources that we have locally and we're always communicating any sort of new um, resources that we may have. Um, as people get grant funding, certain items and resources become available that may not always be available year round. And so as soon as they are finding out that they got the money and they have these resources now, they share it with our network. So we always know who we can call on in a time of need. We practice simulating shelters and we do those internally and externally when we're working in those big exercises. But internally, um, we do those as well on a routine basis just to make sure we're always ready. Our volunteers, we can quickly mobilize our resources, our um, our, our stuff, which could be cots, our blankets, toiletries, um, and then making sure we can quickly identify a facility in the area. Um, upon request, we do train the city parks and recreation staff, public health staff, CERT volunteers, and this is all on our shelter fundamentals training. So this helps equip them with the skills and the knowledge that they would need to stand up a shelter on their own if they ever wanted to um, support their community in that way. But sometimes there are very big disasters which could cause us to need multiple shelters to be open. And sometimes it takes a little while uh, to get some folks from across the country to come here. So we'll be depending on, okay, we'll be depending on our uh, workforce locally first before we call in reinforcements. So where will you go if a disaster strikes? Depending on the emergency event, a safe location is identified as soon as local emergency management personnel evaluate the risk and reported hazard and what it poses to the community. So Red Cross will open emergency evacuation centers, will open cooling and heating centers, and will also open up overnight shelters for days, weeks, or months, depending on the emergency event. We provide assistance with medication replacement, reduce, um, and helping with our, our counselors will help reduce some stress and talk people through some of those traumatic incidents. Caseworkers will provide some of those um, immediate resources people might need to kind of tap into the community, and help look for housing options if they're gonna be displaced for a long period of time or permanently. We do have multiple apps that you can use, um, which are really, really great. So we have an emergency weather app and we have a first aid app and a pet first aid. Here's some of the information that each of them have. So there are alerts and the explanation of what the alerts are in the emergency app. First aid, it talks about a bunch of things, fractures, how to treat burns, how to treat um, bites, stings, asthma attacks, and then even for pets, how to perform CPR on them, how to treat them if they've been in a car accident, if they've drowned, ex experienced any sort of poisoning, things like that. It'll talk you through what steps to take and then of course point you to getting veterinary assistance. And we do recommend that at least one person in the home be trained in CPR, first aid and AED to make sure that anybody in that home who ever experienced a cardiac event um, or any sort of drowning instance can be um, 
assisted right away. Here is this, um, the smoke alarm a QR code for that online website. You can also give us a call. The number's available on some of the flyers that are out on our table, but you can give us a call at that phone number and you can leave your name, leave your address, and a time frame that works for you. And we will go ahead and share that with the volunteers closest to your area who do those installs. So thank you for the time that you guys gave me today. I hope that you guys learned a little bit about what we do at Red Cross, but also there is um, some information at our table about some of those major hazards. And so that way you can figure out how to prepare for your household and meet your ISIS needs. Uh, as you heard earlier, my name is Stephanie Miller. I'm the Disability and Emergency Preparedness Equity Educator for the Arizona Statewide Independent Living Council also known as AZ Silk. I'm gonna to talk to you about general emergency preparedness. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I want you while I'm talking about all this to think about the things that you use every day. Uh, and if you needed to stay in your home for a length of time, as they said, for 72 hours before emergency services can get to you, or if you have to leave your home right away, what kinds of things do you use every day that you'll need in those emergency supply kits? So uh, emergency preparedness to me is, is basically four things. Uh, be informed, make a plan, be ready to stay, and be ready to go. So being informed means you learn the hazards in your area. And as Cecilia just discussed, we have wildfire, we have extreme heat, we have flooding. Um, and you can sign up for emergency alerts, both with your local emergency management office or with the Red Cross. Um, contact your local or your tribal emergency management office. Follow them on social media if you have social media. Um, find out all the ways to get emergency information. So is it through, uh, going to be through an alert to your cell phone? Is it going to be on a website? That kind of thing. Uh, and have a, get, a way to get information even if the power is out. So if you have, you know, a battery powered AM FM radio, for instance. So make a plan means you're going to determine things like evacuation routes, not out, no, not only out of your home, but out of your neighborhood, um, where you can go if you need to evacuate. So if the Red Cross has a shelter open or if there's a hotel in the area or if there's family or friends you can stay with, um, how you'll get transported to, to that sh either shelter location or to your family or friends. Um, and you also wanna make sure you determine if there's a hotel that you can bring your pets to the hotel. Uh, build a strong support network. So talk to your family, your friends, your neighbors, your caregivers, if you have caregivers, um, and include them in your plan and make them a part of it. Uh, keep a paper list of phone numbers and emergency contacts. So you can keep that on your cell phone, but if your cell phone runs out of power, for some reason you don't have a charger, then all of that, you know, unless you memorize it all, you don't have that. So it's good to keep that written down and then have an out of state contact or somebody at least that's out of the area. So if the whole area is affected, you have somebody outside that can help you. And then most importantly, practice that plan. So be ready to stay means that you're gonna have an emergency supply kit that'll last you again for the first 72 hours. Act like the Calvary is not coming. Um, you want to have things in that kit uh, for at least three days, possibly without electricity or running water. And then here's a list. So you need a gallon of drinking water per person per day. So again, for at least three days, you need ready to eat canned foods and other non-perishable sources of food, manual can opener, uh, a crank solar or battery powered AM FM radio, flashlights, tools, batteries, a uh, first aid kit, uh, medications, remember your medications, uh, instant cold packs if you need to keep that medication cold, um, medical supplies if you got syringes, test strips, oxygen tanks, uh, things like that, and then personal hygiene and sanitation items. So remember your supplies for children and pets and have those supplies in a waterproof container. Uh, an example would be you know, totes that you can stick them in just in case there's flooding in your home. Uh, check for emergency, check your emergency supply kit every six months and rotate your items out as needed. So be ready to go 
means that you're going to evacuate your home and you want to leave right away. If there's a wildfire coming towards your home, if you happen to live in an area that's near wildland, um, you want to be able to leave without searching around for everything you need. You want it all in, located in one place. And your, your go kit or your go bag, or some people call it a bug out bag, is a, just an extension of that 72 hour kit for you know your purposes for staying in your home. So here's another list of what you would need. And rather than some of these larger items, of course you want portable items. So you need bottles of water, lightweight, uh, ready to eat foods. You can put granola bars in there and things like that. Uh, remember personal hygiene items, change of clothes, shoes, coat, hat, uh, extra set of car and house keys, prescription and other medical supplies. So if you have canes, hearing aids, reading glasses, regular glasses, um, think about all those medical supplies. Think about the things that you use every day. And if you had to leave the house now, what would you need to take with you? Um, think about copies of important documents, put them in waterproof containers, you know, you can stick them in a Ziploc bag. Um, first aid kit, again, flashlights with extra batteries and battery powered devices. Um, eyeglasses and contact lens supplies, gloves, masks, whistles, matches, paper and pencil. The list goes on and on, but I, again, this is kind of a general overview and I just want you to think about the things that you would need if you use every day. So another way to think of it is the five Ps. So people and pets is the first one. Personal items, so your water, food, toiletries, change of clothes, prescriptions and other medical supplies, paper, uh, was, which would be the copies of important documents and then priceless items. So again, each person and pet needs a go bag um, and then use something that is easy to transport, such as a suitcase on wheels. You don't want a bag that's too heavy that you can't move very far. Put the bag in a place that's easily accessible and easy to remember. And that's very important because when you have to go in a split second, we know that sometimes we just like, our brains go into survival mode and we forget. And there was an instance at my house where there was something going on with a water heater and it could have led to a, a fire. And that made me think about where was my go bag and I forgot where I put my go bag. And it turns out it was in the garage, but I remembered where my dog's go bags were. And so, <laughs> so I ended up moving it to where theirs are so that I don't forget it. Uh, so again, you want to check your go bag every six months and rotate the items as needed. So uh, I'll leave the questions for a second, but um, you know, I wanted to let you know that of things that maybe you'd want to stay at home for and things that maybe you want to leave for. And so when the, you know, the, the pandemic, which, you know, obviously COVID is still here, but when it was at its highest point, we were told to stay in our homes, right? And don't go out unless you absolutely needed to. Get your supplies to last you for two weeks and stay in your home. Uh, another reason why you'd wanna stay is if there is a, like a chemical spill and you're too close to, to that area for, you know, first responders to tell you to leave, they're gonna tell you to shelter in place and stay in your home. Uh, reasons why you would want to leave would again be a wildfire. It could also be a chemical spill. If you're out far enough from the spill that you have time to leave, then emergency responders might tell people in another area, just go and evacuate your home. Um, and then of course, um, we, we heard about house fires. So that would be a reason that you want to get out right away and be able to take the things that you need with you. So that is all for me and I will hand it back over to you. All right, so do we have any questions from the audience for Cecilia or Stephanie? Yes. I always wondered how long to keep water in the water bottles and just, is it good for garden water? The rule is um, to change, to check your, your supply kit every six months. So I'd say don't leave it in there any longer than six months. And then as far as garden water, I, I'm assuming that's just me, but I'm assuming it's still okay. You can use it for that purpose. Is the present well? So um, one of the things that we are doing is videotaping today. And so we will have those recordings on the Benavia website. 
benavia.org. Just give us a little time afterwards to get those ready. Thank you. What other questions do you have? Well, I don't know about you, but I feel better knowing that Stephanie and Cecilia are out there doing the work that they do every day. So did you learn a few things in this first section? Yeah, for sure. Did you have another question? Buy a syringe. Where do you buy a syringe? Well, that's only if you if you need syringes and test strips and things like that. So um, that's, you know, specific to the person who would need it. That's just an example of a medical supply that you might need. Oh, good question. Yeah. So that would be if you were normally using syringes, you probably have a supply and you just want to make sure that you have enough. I wanted to share with you, um, Stephanie mentioned a go bag, having a go bag, and also having a go bag for your documents. And these bags are available um, in two places out in your resource tables. They're at the Arizona Department of Emergency Management and Military Affairs. DEMA is here. They have these. And the Benavia table has these. So this is for your important documents. So you can put all your important documents in there, keep it in your safe. It's funny, I tried to bring one of these home and my husband said, well, our documents are in our safe. And I said, what are you going to do? Pick up the 150 pound safe and walk it out the door? <laughs> so anyway, I think he's using it. Yes, ma'am. Where can one go to take the CPR course? Well, we have a couple of, we have Arizona Fire and Medical here today. And I know that they have volunteers that teach that. And American Red Cross does too, right, Cecilia? Yes. Yeah, so we have um, we have the our training services offers ones where you can receive a certificate, and so that will have the first aid, the CPR, and you can kind of select which class you're wanting. If it is just going to be for adults, or if you'd like it to have like children, infants in there as well, um, that one will have a small cost. We also have a free version that we do, but that's a hands only CPR um, that. I and my volunteers and our disaster services will present to communities. Um, and so that one is bystander CPR. So it is doing the compressions without the rescue breaths. So it's a good basis to kind of have a good foundation. So that way you know how to um, properly administer those compressions to a person. Um, you know, if you needed to jump in until first responders arrive. It is great to get the certification, however, but just for that quick, easy, you know, quick and dirty information, we do have our, um, our presentation we do for hands-only CPR. And I was told also that AARP also offers that. And Stephanie, did you have more? I actually had just another addition to what I was presenting on. Uh, I know I gave you a big long list and it seems like how do we get all of these things, especially if you're on a limited income. And I just want you to know, just start where you're at. Look around your house right now, find some supplies that you have that are already there. There's a lot of supplies out here that you can make use of as well to put in your kits. So I know it's easy for me to stand up here and say, do all this stuff, but just start where you're at. Thank you. And one more time, will you help me thank Cecilia and Stephanie? And um, they will be here during the break, um, and the American Red Cross has a table, so please go ahead and visit them. Um, is Jessica Perry here? Jessica. Okay. Well, we're going to just have a little switch here. We're going to go ahead and take a break right now, and I'm going to invite you to go out and visit those tables that we talked about, which is in the next room. There's some light snacks in there. Please don't bring the snacks back in here. They want bottled water only. And we're going to come back right around 11 o'clock. So just about 15 minutes to visit those tables. Come back and hear from our next three speakers. Thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to our next speaker. Jessica Perry is the Public Affairs Manager for Arizona Public Service for the West Valley. And she's been really busy this morning. <laughs> she handles local government affairs and works with local chambers on behalf of APS. She's from Buckeye, so she's a West Sider, yay, and has previously worked for the Goodyear Mayor and Council, and prior to that, for the Arizona Corporation Commission. I'm so excited to hear from Jessica about what APS is doing behind the scenes to keep us prepared for weather emergencies and heat emergencies, and I'm going to just turn it over to Jessica. 
As Jennifer said, I'm Jessica Perry. I do local government affairs and public affairs for APS. I'm so grateful to be here on behalf of APS. We'll go through several slides and I'll keep it pretty high level. It's a lot of information, but we'll have time for questions or I'll be outside or at our booth out in the other room if you have any additional. So to get started, I'll just talk a little bit about our service territory. APS is the largest and longest serving utility in Arizona. We cover a wide territory. It's very unique compared to other utilities across the nation. We have the desert, the heat that we deal with, the cold desert nights that not everybody is aware of, the snow, the mountains, we even serve down in the Grand Canyon. So our employees are constantly being trained to deploy, to work in various conditions. As you can see, we have a lot of assets that we have to take care of and it requires a lot of um, maintenance and inspections. And that is all required to serve our 1.3 million customers. The 1.2 of those 1.3 million customers are all residential. And so making sure that we have adequate supply of power to um, supply you all with power through the hot summer months is really what we plan for year round. I'll be talking a lot about last year because that's a lot of the information that I have on hand. We're updating at the moment for 2024. Today we're going down to the Arizona Corporation Commission to give them an update on how we're going to plan for the summer. So please be patient with all my numbers, but I'll be talking about this year as well. So to recap from last year, we all know it was hot. As you know, I was, I'm from Buckeye. I was melting. I was like, I'm gonna get out of here. But I didn't because it's home. But we saw a record breaking heat, 55 days of at or above 110 degrees, 35 of those, 31 of those were consecutive. Back in 1979 was when we saw our last record of 18 consecutive days. So really, our system was put to work last summer. All of the heat encourages customers to turn on their AC, turn it down, um, start using all their appliances because they're not outside, enjoying the beautiful weather. So making sure that we have the infrastructure ready to take on those high temps is what we plan for all year round. And, and part of that, why we're so successful in not um, preventing any dips in our reliability last summer, well, was because of our planning and our employees, but also our customers. It's important for us to have programs that customers can sign up for so we can, they can help us during those hot summer months, whether it's a residential customer or a business customer, and I'll go through those later on, but we really value the customers that put enroll on some of these programs that we offer in order to make sure that we're available, we are providing available power 100% of the time. Um, one good thing about last summer was the monsoon season was pretty inactive. We didn't, we usually replace about 100 or 340 poles a year because of weather. Last year it was down 100, so at least we got that going for us. <laughs> Our clean energy commitment is always on top of mind, but making sure that we're reaching 100% clean energy by 2050 um, without pr um, risking reliability and affordability to customers is how we're going to get there. And retiring the coal by 2031 is important, is still on track, but we're going to rely on, we couldn't make those goals without Palo Verde nuclear generation facility and our natural gas facilities. And those are really serving as the bridge as these new technologies advance and we can utilize them at the times that we need them when maybe they're not producing as much as our customers demand. So in 2023, um, our numbers, we're very vast. This is all of our generation portfolio. We keep it diverse because we don't want to rely on one resource. We don't want to pass on a bunch of um, fees onto our customers because one resource is more costly that year. So we keep it diverse and you'll see nuclear, coal for a little bit longer, um, renewables, that includes our residential rooftop solar, and then energy storage systems. And then in there is also our customer programs that I've already meant, that I said I would go over here shortly. There's two columns and the nameplate capacity is really in a perfect world, these resources will provide us that much power. I don't know about you, but it's not a perfect world and it's not a perfect anytime, anything. So we really look at the peak capacity that we can generate from those facilities. 
And that number is from last year. It'll be boosted quite a bit for this upcoming year because we do see a lot of growth on our system from economic development and um, residential um, development coming online. And so making sure that we're planning and looking at what's coming online as we're looking at the future. So how do we figure out what we need in our generation portfolio? It's based on our peak resource and demand that we look at trends, we look at customer demands, and look at what we need to plan for. So we can, this is again 2023, it'll be about 300 megawatts for this upcoming summer that we need. So we've added that to our generation portfolio. As you can see, 2021, 2022 were pretty consistent and 2023 had a big jump. We look, we're gonna have another big jump this year. And to put it in perspective, that's all in megawatts. One megawatt feeds about 130, 150 homes. So we are really producing the power, but that is not why we're here today, but making sure we have enough power is helpful to make sure that we have a reliable grid, a safe, strong, reliable grid. So our transmission and distribution teams, these are our operations folks. Um, safety is at the utmost importance to APS and making sure that our employees are prepared for anything that comes at them. They're ready for the heat to, so they can stay hydrated, that we have enough crews on hand to deploy linemen to work during the hours. But then if it's extended, we can't have them working for 12 hours. That's going to lead to mistakes. So we make sure that we have crews ready to go to transition out so we have our top guys working on your lines getting you power as soon as you can. During October to May is really when we are maintaining our lines, making sure we're planning for those summer heated months, looking at all of our lines, and you saw how many lines we have, how many miles and how many substations. So we are constantly monitoring those and looking at what opportunities we can upgrade to prevent any extended outages if a weather event should happen. And during those months, you may receive a notice that says, you know, APS needs to take a little bit of outage. And that is important because that's so we can do that maintenance during that time. Otherwise, if they're in the summer months, we need to maintain that line. It could create um, some extra power, um, a lot of heat on our system and create other outages. So making sure that our equipment is prepared as well as our employees is important to us. If there is an outage, we go, we really look to our customers to report it. We may not even be aware of it until we hear from our customers. And so making sure that you have the outage map, um, the application, the app on your cell phone or go online, call our customer care center, please report these outages because we'll know which feeders to look at. And even if you think your neighbor reported it, please report it too because that helps us make sure that we're looking at the right infrastructure. So when we get one of those outage notifications, our, we send a crew out and they go and inspect the line. And depending on what they find, they'll report back. We'll get the equipment needed. We'll get the guys out ready to install new equipment or fix the line and update our outage map. And that's where you'll find how long it, we think it'll take to restore power. That's where I get my information, even as an employee from APS. I keep the app downloaded. I look there to see how long we think customers will be out, if it's been updated within a couple hours, because maybe another weather event is coming and it's really windy, so our crews are having a difficult time to make those corrections. So just making sure that I keep updated on that is helpful, because if it turns into an extended outage and we know customers are without power for hours on end, we have to work with our emergency management partners. We want to make sure that our customers know where to go to stay cool. And those um, cooling stations that our partners stand up year round or during those summer months are really what we rely on. So we work with our emergency management partners to make sure that we're delivering resources when needed. So not really um, pertaining to this, this area, but up in the um, mountains where we see a lot of forest areas, we make sure in make sure that there's not any trees growing within our lines, around our poles. We keep a safe distance because we don't want to contribute to a longer forest fire if that should occur. So we work, we have a fire mitigation plan that we work with public safety and other agencies to make sure that they're ready, that we have this 
communication line set up in case of an event. So that's what we go over every March as a company, making sure that everybody's aware of who needs to be on call, when you need to be on call, and what you need to be prepared for. So emergency management, as I mentioned, we really rely on our external partners, the fire departments, um, emergency managers across the valley. We really rely on these partnerships and we do drills together. We make sure that everybody's practicing so that in case of an emergency, we are prepared. So we have those plans. We have plans if we have to shred load. And so um, making sure that if we have to take power from customers, it's not the customers that really need that need it the most, like a wastewater treatment. We don't want to turn off wastewater or water um, facilities. So working with specific partners to turn off power to give us a little bit relief. Um, also, if something were to happen with one of our generation facilities and it goes down and it's cold, that's called a black start where we have to start it from zero and let it warm up. And we can't warm it up too quickly because that'll put a lot of stress on our system. So making sure that we're doing it safely and making sure we're getting customers online as quickly as possible, but maybe in key areas or as um, slowly as we can so we're not creating any more damage. But what we want to do is focus on the customer and that's why after the pandemic we started a 24 7 customer care center and so that phone number that i have listed up there you can also find it online is a care center that you can call 24 7 to find out about an outage to ask about a bill to ask for assistance programs ask about solar whatever you have interested they have the resources to connect you to who would be able to talk to you about those details as i mentioned the outage map is a huge resource for us and so making sure that you have that downloaded reporting your um, outage if you have one, and um, that's constantly being updated. We just updated the system, I believe last week, and so it's ready to be deployed for the summer. Um, hopefully it's more user-friendly. And then um, we're working on some customer care open houses. Those are where we can come into the community, have some face time with our customers and answer some questions. And I'm working on scheduling one for this area soon. This is rolling out and it's statewide so really slow rolling these but hopefully this is my priority area that i want to have an open house at and then the heat relief and energy efficiency are also great opportunities for our customers there's a lot of information on here i'm not going to read read through everything but it can also be found at aps.com outage it's a very pretty display you just click on the columns and all the information gets shown but i do want to highlight a few things we really encourage you to have your APS account number readily available. If it's in your phone and your phone dies, then make having it written down somewhere that's accessible so then we can look at it and help you out if you need it. Um, having a phone charger. If you haven't visited our APS table, if we still have some, we had portable phone chargers. So then if your phone dies and you need to call somebody for help or just to contact us about an outage, then um, you can charge your phone. And then some safety tips, um, making sure that you stay 100 feet away from any down power lines. If you see down power lines and poles, please stay about 100 feet away and call 911 and then call us. 911 will probably call us too. But, and then we can come out and make sure that they get fixed. If you have a medical device, um, some equipment and for you or your loved one in your home, we want you to register it. And it's not because we're nosy, but it's because then if we do have a planned outage, that is coming to your area, we can give you some additional notice. So then you can plan to make sure that your equipment is ready, readily available during that time. So our, I always put this screenshot of this, of the website, just because it, it's kind of confusing. It, if you don't require energy support, as one of our assistance programs, you can still get medical care and um, be a medical care customer. And so just making sure that you're aware of that. We have a lot of assistance programs and I won't go through them in depth, but all of these are listed at APS.com slash assistance. For those that qualify, you can talk to our customer care folks. You can look online to see what we have to offer. Um, we also partner with a lot of state utility assistance programs and other organizations like um, Foundation for Senior Living or Arizona Faith Network. And so those partnerships, if our website's not up to date today, it will be by next month where there's links that you can connect to as well.
um, some of the programs that I talked about. One main one is this cool rewards program, and it goes on during the summer months. You just have to purchase a smart thermometer, enroll in this program. You get about $30 off your mo monthly bill for enrolling, and it just allows us to control your thermostat. It's not scary, I promise, but we'll turn it up if we need it. But here's the thing, if you have guests over or it's too hot for you, you can override it at any time. And so we really encourage customers to enroll in this program because you can help us keep reliability going strong throughout the summer months. There's a couple other resources that you can find on our website at APS.com um, to look at what your energy use is and perhaps how you can save, um, be more efficient in your home. Um, and just wanted to highlight those two as well. In summary, that was a lot, but we just wanna make sure that you guys are feeling com confident in APS and making sure that we are prepared for whatever nature throws at us. If a mylar balloon gets into our lines and creates an outage, I never thought that would happen, but it is very common. Um, so just making sure that you're confident that we are working behind the scenes to make sure that customers are receiving their power reliably, especially during those summer months. So that is what I have to share today. If you have any questions, happy to attempt to address them. Um, if you don't, then I will be outside as well. Okay, there's questions for test them. Go ahead and say your question. Uh, can you lie to private contract or not? Uh, so one of the, in on the emergency preparedness here, uh, one of the things you hear on TV or hear as a possible emergency is uh, a hack through the internet and that the power grid is one of, uh, you know, vulnerabilities there. What is APS doing to uh, prevent? Well, it starts with our employees. So as an employee, I have to go through a quarterly training for cybersecurity every or quarter and then make sure and pass it. And then we also get tested. The company sends out these messages. If we click on a link that we're not supposed to, we get dinged. We have to go through the training again. If we do that so many times, we don't have access to the internet. So we take it very serious. And that's at the employee level. And then at the management level, there's a lot of conversations that are high level that I'm not privy to, but I know that we're constantly looking at cybersecurity and preparing for any threats that come onto our system. What other questions? Kate? Uh, do you know if there is a cooling station available, APS cooling station available for Sun City West? Well, I should have looked that up before I came here. Yes. But if you go to mag.com, and I can get this information out to Jennifer, but there's a map of across the valley where cooling stations are stood up during the summer months, and those are put on by our partners. We are the experts in restoring power. We're not the experts in providing services to customers. So like I said, we definitely value our partnership and those customers that stand those cooling stations up. And when we do have an outage, and a cooling station is stood up, it's found on the outage map. You're welcome. Sanchez. Thank you. Jessica, great job. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm with the City of Surprise, as you know. We love working with you and partnering with you. Um, good question about the, the cooling stations. Uh, we need more of those in our Northwest Valley. So if you're part of a, a faith community or uh, local organization. Um, there's an easy way to get uh, registered for those heat relief. Uh, we at the City of Surprise have several heat relief uh, um, cooling centers, and so thank you for bringing that up. I just want to say we're, we are, serve as the uh, utility assistance uh, helpers um, for Sun City West, Sun City, Surprise, El Mirage, Waddell Women. So if you know of anyone that needs a little bit of help, we uh, APS does a phenomenal job helping us with bill assistance. There's, you can apply online. We have people to help you apply online. If you need, if you know of anyone that needs help paying their, their utility bills, not APS only, but all of your utility bills, we have staff to be there ready for you. And then also uh, we, we had too many people across 
the valley lose their lives from heat-related illness last year. And over half of those people had were living in a home. They just didn't have their air conditioning on or working. And so if you know of anyone that their air conditioning unit goes out, Maricopa County has a program to help you repair repair that. So there's income qualifications, and we'll send that to you, Jennifer. Um, but uh, please keep an eye out for your neighbors, and if they're if they're not running their air on purpose because they either can't afford to run the air or it's broken, there are programs out there to assist. And APS has been a great partner in that. Um, so thank you, Jessica. Oh, thank you. So lots of great resources there. Um, I wanted to also mention that if, as Seth said, if you're with an organization that um, might want to provide shelter services or cooling center services, um, American Red Cross also helps with that. So you can stop at their, their booth and get Cecilia's contact information, our first speaker, because she works with all of that as well. So thank you. And Seth, your department has a table in the resource center as well, so they can provide that utility assistance. Okay, perfect. What other questions do we have for Jessica? I either really bored you or answer all your questions. <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. Let's all thank us. No, thank you all. I appreciate it. So this is the public health and health care portion. And so we're going to have Tina speak first. Tina is the Banner Health Emergency Preparedness Program Manager. She's responsible for emergency preparedness programs at Banner Boswell, Banner Del Webb, and Banner Thunderbird Medical Centers. She's a nationally and internationally recognized certified emergency manager, a FEMA master exercise practitioner, and that means di disaster preparedness exercise. Do you do other exercises? No. Okay, <laughs> and a certified healthcare emergency professional. Tina has been working for Banner Health for 20 years and has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And then Kelsey will be speaking right after her. Kelsey Andrews is an operations supervisor at Maricopa County Department of Public Health, Office of Preparedness and Response. Prior to the role that she has now, she was a, a 911 dispatcher for seven years. I bet you could write a book about that. Acquiring invaluable skills in crisis management and emergency communication. As operations supervisor, her current role, she oversees vaccine event management program and various operational plans providing crucial support to responses when needed. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Purdue University and a Master's in Science for Criminal Justice and Public Safety from Indiana University. She brings a comprehensive understanding of societal dynamics and public safety principles in her work. So let's start with Tina and then we'll turn it over to Kelsey. Hi everybody, how are you doing? Good. Um, so what do you think? Because I think when we first started, I don't know how many of you have been here the whole time. Uh, Jennifer had said, this is not what you do. This is you're going to take a deep dive into the world of emergency management. What do you think? Are you, are you ready to go now? We, have, we got preppers going on. Excellent. Again, my name's Tina. I've had the pleasure of working with Banner Health for 20 years. Um, they're a phenomenal corporation. And I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Boswell and Webb here in the community. So I have their, the lovely photos up here, Boswell on my left, I guess it would be over there, and then um, Thunderbird on the, excuse me, uh, Webb on the right. And I also work at Thunderbird. And I do emergency preparedness. What does that really mean? I have the task of training our staff, who again, they are not emergency managers. They are clinical staff, they're ancillary support teams, they could be facilities, they could be housekeeping, they could be nurses in the ICU. Emergency management is not what they do every day. Again, I like to say it's what I do every day. So my job in Banner, in my hospitals, is to train them and, and make them feel comfortable. If something happens, which, what do you all think, this is an interactive session here, what would you think would typically happen in our hospitals that would rise to the occasion of, we have an incident management team that would be deployed to respond? What can you think of based on these other speeches we've had that could happen in the hospital world? You may have been in there and something happened. 
Well, unfortunately, active shooter is, or an active threat even, is taken quite seriously. And what I will say with that is what we do is we practice. We practice the unspeak, we don't practice that, but our response to it, it would be very chaotic, very quick. And it, it's important that people know, and I will just say here, since I've done a lot of these, um, practice the principles of run, hide, fight. Run if your life is in danger, if you can get out. This is what we do in the hospital world too. Know your escape routes, even in, in the churches here. You know, what goes to the outside? Where can you go quickly? If you can't run, if the shooter is in your way, then hide somewhere, preferably in a room where you can either lock the door, turn the lights off, pull the blinds down, silence your phone, or barricade that door until you know that law enforcement is here. And then lastly, it would be fight, and I didn't realize I'd be doing this today. Um, you'd be fighting, if your life is in imminent danger, if there's the shooter, there's you, you're gonna do what you can to protect your life. So take an object, I mean, you could use, I don't know where that little portable microphone is, throw a microphone, a fire extinguisher. You know, in the hospital world, we have IV poles, it could be a telephone, anything like that. So that's definitely something that we do practice and train to. And we're, we have great partners with our law enforcement teams here in the community. So um, we do this quite a bit. And actually, we just did one for Boswell and Webb, I want to say it was two months ago. So we did do that. But other things, can you think of anything else? Wow. You guys are all over it. <laughs> um, it's very close. Our hospital, Webb and Basel, both are on the train line, and they have hazardous materials that they're carrying. So we do take that seriously. I can tell you what we do internally is we have emergency response teams that are prepared. It's, it's a bit challenging because it's on a volunteer basis. But if we can't support that team, we're going to reach out to our local hazmat teams, and we would anyway in that. Um, but there could be somebody that says they were contaminated by something that um, there was a train derailment and there was some gas, plumes of gas around. More than likely, though, what we're going to have is people who come in and maybe they have gasoline or they have minimal exposure, some other kind of chemical, but we have decon showers that we can shower them off and get rid of the contaminants if we have to. So we, that is another one. Um, you guys, like I said, you're all over it, but I can tell you what typically we have um, are power outages. We talked about that. APS was just here. And we were fortunate that we have generators. Sometimes the generators aren't always working, but we make sure that um, we are prepared just in case. And I know, Julie, you're here from Olive Branch. We had part of our campuses we were responsible for, too. So at Boswell, Olive Branch had a power outage. There was like a blip in the power, but it caused some issues. So we did respond over there. And that went well. We recovered. You were without food for a while, unfortunately. But the backup system for that is they can back up with our culinary department in the hospital. We have those plans in place because that's a big piece of what I do, too, is the planning of what we're going to do. And lastly, I would say, um, you know, we talked about monsoon activity, extreme heat. We analyze at the hospital level what we are at risk for in the community. And the community does as well, Maricopa County does. You know, I know you guys all do, we call it hazard vulnerability assessment. And we, we um, get our multidisciplinary teams together. We base it on what's happened historically. What are we at risk for, like the, the rail lines? If we've had a lot of power outages, water intrusions, maybe a toilet overflowed, because believe it or not, it happens all the time in the hospital. Someone's flushing what they shouldn't be flushing. And it can, it can cause damage down below. So, you know, it's crazy, but when you get that into like an OR suite or something, this, a sterile area, it, it wreaks a lot of havoc. So these are examples of what we do for training for staff. Um, we're also very fortunate within Banner that we have what we call a corporate emergency operations center. They are, you know, we go from here, we follow the chain of command, the hospital to our corporate EOC, then they may reach out to the county, to the state, it, you know, it varies depending on what that incident is. But I will say during our COVID response, really our response was driven by our uh, emergency operations center. They managed everything for, for um, Banner, and then we put that into practice within Banner. That's just an example of what the corporate EOC would do. Um, another thing that we do is, you know, we have all these community partners in the room. We've had all these speakers. We prepare for community events. Can you think of anything that's happened within the year or two in the community? I mean, I'm talking... Maricopa County. We had Super Bowl here a year ago. That was a big deal. 
And I can tell you over at Thunderbird specifically, we were the first hospital in line if there was um, some kind of a military aircraft that was to land. So we had to prepare. We have a helipad, but it wouldn't support the weight and you know the size of that military aircraft. So we had to make sure we had a helipad on the ground. So, um, but it, it takes, I hear this again in, within Banner, it does take a, truly a village, all these community planners getting together, talking about the what ifs, how are we going to manage all of this stuff. That is what we do. And I take great pride with Banner that we do it well. We had um, Final Four was just down the road. We had, uh, I, I remember during Super Bowl, Estrella was a little bit closer than Basel, but when I saw, I think it was Rihanna, wasn't it? She was up on that that platform thing, I'm like, holy cow, don't fall, because that would have been bad. <laughs> so it's, it's stuff like that. Waste management we're aware of. You know, our community partners are out there. We, um, a lot of times, we'll have a multi-agency coordination center set up that we will participate in. And, um, but again, it's a community effort of planning and training, and then exercises, like I said, active shooter exercises, we may say we've had a couple of power outages. This assessment that we've done, we typically will exercise to the top five risks that we have. And then we um, develop a plan every year. And we have an emergency management committee that goes over all of this. Again, it's multidisciplinary from administration, department directors all across the house that we look at. Again, it's not what everybody does every day, it's what we do. So make sure people feel comfortable that we do a sufficient amount of trainings, that if we have an exercise and we recognize someone said, hey, I wasn't prepared for this, I didn't know the role from an incident commander down to what we call our section chiefs, then we, we hold additional training. It's our lessons learned after every incident and after every exercise. This is just the cycle of emergency management. We mitigate, we try to look at what we're at risk for, I don't know if he's kind of small. <laughs> then it's preparedness, then it is response, and then it is recovery from that, and then business continuity there is in the middle. It's a continual cycle. So we just try to keep this in mind for everything that we do. It, typically, we focus on the mitigation, the preparedness, and response. Recovery is probably what we don't practice enough, although I will say it's extremely important because if, if we were to sustain a, a long-lasting power outage and we couldn't really do patient care anymore in one of our hospitals, what are we gonna do? Where are we gonna go? Where are these patients gonna go? So these are the things that we think about all the time. Um, I'm not gonna go into great detail about this because one of the other presenters kind of went into this, but I just wanna make you aware that at our table, the, um, we're sharing with the Olive Branch Senior Center, the takeaway one, two, three, I really am a fan of ready.gov. It's FEMA sponsored. If you get on ready.gov website, it gives you everything you wanna know about making a plan, uh, communicating with your family, with your, your loved ones, you know, in and out of state. We talked about this before. How to build a kit, what to put in your kit, what to think about. We talked about, you know, do we do elder care? Do we have special needs ourselves? Do we have mobility issues? You know, lots of medications, all that kind of stuff. But take one of these or look for it yourself um, on ready.gov. It's great. It's called Take Control in 123. And it will go over everything. And it's especially this particular guide is built for older adults. So I found it, it's very helpful. And just don't forget when you do your plan, especially make sure that you communicate to your family that you have done this plan. Again, you assess your needs. And I like to say that the more you do this, you're really going to be prepared and knowledge is power. Think about all this stuff in advance before the disaster strikes. But communicate, communicate, communicate. I will tell you, even in the hospital world, when after every incident or exercise, we, we evaluate our response. And pretty much every time, it's communication. We didn't get the message fast enough. You talk about an active shooter, boy, that's gonna be a critical message. We do have the capability and banner to send out a, a message, a broadcast message campus-wide or just to our response team. It just depends on what's going on, who needs to know what. But we can get it done pretty quickly. And through our security team, we can get it even faster and we can announce it overhead. So, um, you know, all things to think about, but communication is huge. Get your plan in place. Utilize a support network. You're not in this alone. You know, work with your family, with your community, with your churches, with, with Banner. If you're looking for some providers for help, you know, reach out to your provider and they, they can assist you with things. Um, and again, it's just fostering connections can make all the difference in navigating life's unexpected challenges. We certainly do have them. And as we get older, I think we tend to have more of them. 
uh, not necessarily from a disaster point of view, but just any kind of a challenge. If you need to, you know, some help, then um, you know, be prepared. So again, I'm a, a proponent of sharing the wealth of information from all of our community resources, American. Red Cross, again, they were here earlier, great resource to have. They have something called Emergency Preparedness for old, Older Adults, and you can click on their, their website to get that. And then again, this take control in 123isready.gov, and feel free to reach out to Banner directly for any guidance you may have. But be reassured that we are working behind the scenes. We do partner with everything we do with the community. We are here to ensure your safety, as well as in our hospitals, life safety, patient safety, doctors, physicians, volunteers, visitors, you name it. That is our number one focus at all times is safety. Again, we work behind the scenes, you know, if in case you wonder, hey, I wonder what the hospital does, or I hope you have some kind of a, a takeaway now as to what we do, we do quite a bit. And um, by planning ahead, just make sure that you're ready. So we want you to be prepared and not unprepared. Thank you, that's it. Appreciate your time. My name is Kelsey Andrews. I'm an operations supervisor for the Maricopa County Department of Public Health. Um, I work within the Office of Preparedness and Response. It's a long title. Um, and I, I handle pr primarily um, the needs and the plans that are actually operational based. So going out and, and doing what we've planned for. So it's already kind of been mentioned, um, but the five stages of emergency management, that's kind of uh, the areas that we focus on um, when it comes to planning within um, the operation of preparedness and response. Um, but kind of taking a step back, when you think public health, what comes to mind? COVID, yeah, <laughs> disease, disease okay. and COVID, yeah, um, and, and I'll admit, um, but prior to becoming, um, working for public health, I worked more on the criminal justice side as a 911 operator, um, so when COVID hit and I ended up getting a job over in Arizona, I was in Indiana at the time, I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, I got hired with COVID along with a lot of people that work in public health all over the country, and I really had no idea what public health truly was. I mean, when we think of public health, we generally think vaccines and clinics, um, testing, um, even I know some public healths do um, like foodborne testing and things like that. We don't, that's a separate agency within um, the, the county, um, but things like that. I never really truly thought emergency preparedness with public health, because right, we think emergency preparedness, we think our fire, our police, um, our emergency management, but not public health. Well, COVID really kind of changed that in uh, realizing what public health brings to the table. Um, we have a our own emergency preparedness um, division within public health, Office of Preparedness and Response. Within that, we have um, a team that's focused on planning, a team that's focused on operations, a team that's focused, focused on logistics, and a team that's focused on special projects. Um, and so that just makes one section of public health. We also have our nurses and our clinic staff. We have clinics all throughout the valley that serve um, the community, including those that um, are marginalized or might not have access to insurance to go to a pharmacy um, or a healthcare provider. Um, we also have epidemiologists um, that are our kind of brain of public health. Um, they do a lot of surveillance and investigations. We work hand in hand with them during responses. Uh, we have our own uh, vaccine strike team that goes out into the community um, for those that can't easily get to a vaccine event or clinic, um, especially during COVID, um, where it was very difficult for a lot of the populations that had some mistrust with going into clinics or healthcare. Um, so public health is, is quite a large, um, ours is a large agency that has very different sections that all kind of come together, especially during a response. Um, for today, I'm gonna kind of focus on what I do um, within the Office of Preparedness and Response and kind of just give you a rundown of what we do and how we serve the public um, during those emergencies or scary times. So one of the big components of what we do is planning. Um, we probably have about 20, 30 plans 
that we operate and maintain within the Office of Preparedness and Response that um, coincide with different types of responses or needs in the community. Um, for example, we have a medical surge plan. Uh, so if during high times uh, like COVID where hospitals were and uh, medical facilities were getting overrun, we have the opportunity to provide um, whatever they need, whether it's additional staffing or uh, resources. We work with um, the state health um, to kind of coordinate so that the hospitals can kind of focus on what they're doing and we can kind of be a go-between. Um, we also do pandemic response planning. Um, we saw that with COVID. We also learned that we were very underprepared um, as everybody in the country and the world was um, feeling. Uh, so we've made a lot of changes in how we prepare for a pandemic uh, and we have specific plans for that. Um, and a lot of those are getting updated even as we speak right now. Um, another huge uh, role that we serve is our medical countermeasures plan. It's probably one of our largest plans and most robust that we have. Um, and we have a specific planner that that's their sole um, responsibility is that one plan um, that's probably going to take about a year or so to update after we've learned lessons from COVID. Um, but what that medical countermeasures really means is, you know, uh, those large pods during COVID that you went to, did everybody have a chance to visit one of those, whether it was um, at uh, medical parking lots, um, there was the state had the large ones at um, the, the football stadium. Um, a lot of them were drive through in the beginning. Um, so those ones where we can handle large quantities of people coming in and provide them vaccines or medications, um, depending on what that response is. Uh, we also work closely with um, our Palo Verde partners, um, with McDem, our emergency management and other local partners, um, providing assistance should there be an incident there that we need to provide medication. Um, we're involved in that planning. Um, so it's a lot of just making sure that we have everything figured out ahead of time with these plans that we know that when we have to go into an activation or a response that we can just go. There's no spending time trying to figure things out and planning. The plan is already there. We just go straight into operations, which is what I do. But a lot of what we do is also providing support to our hospital partners. Um, we are in contact with them quite frequently. Uh, you know, if they've got needs, we're available, um, especially during times when they're seeing large amount of numbers. We have a system that we use where we can kind of track if they're on divert, not taking patients, or if their ICUs are overrun, things like that. So we can kind of be prepared and reach out and say, hey, do you guys need something? Um, so that's kind of definitely one of the things that we, we really try and maintain is those strong bonds with our hospitals. And um, we have quite a few in this county, um, including trauma centers. Um, those are obviously our big concerns. If the trauma centers are getting overrun, there's definitely a concern that we need to start talking about and seeing how we um, as public health can support our hospitals so that they can support the community partners. And again, I've kind of talked about this. Um, we work with not only um, hospitals and medical facilities. Uh, we also sometimes work with our long-term care partners. Uh, we've got thousands of large and small LTCs throughout our county. Um, during COVID, it was very difficult for them to be able to get vaccines um, and living in congregate, congregate settings, um, often dealing with the, the aging population, there was a lot of risk. Um, and so we worked um, heavily to ensure that we were vac providing vaccines to our long-term care facilities because uh, they couldn't easily just go up to one of those pods or go to a pharmacy. Um, so we were able to bring the vaccine to them. And that's what kind of kicked off our strike teams that go out into the community um, is first working with our long-term care partners during COVID. Um, so basically we, we serve as that support function. Um, we might not always activate when other partners are activated, but we're always there supporting when needed. Um, so again, we've kind of already gone over this a little bit. Um, 
just making sure that we're doing everything on our part to ensure that we can help the community, um, whether that's ensuring that we're exercising our pods, which are very uh, cumbersome to put together, especially when you're serving thousands in a day, um, eight lanes, providing vaccines or medications, depending on the incident. Um, we, we have to prepare for that. And so we're, we're required um, and we put it on ourselves as well to make sure that we're doing exercises. And sometimes that means we work with community partners to ensure that we have those connections and that we're able to uh, build off of that so that we can serve the community. Um, and I don't know, is anybody here an MRC volunteer? Medical Reserve Corps? So that's, that's another um, resource that falls under um, the Office of Preparedness and Response within Public Health is our Medical Reserve Corps or our MRC volunteers. So they often work alongside of us during all of these incidents. We um, are a large public health, but we in no way can serve 4.5 million um, residents and growing all by ourselves. Um, so we have thousands of um, community members that volunteer through our Medical Reserve Corps. So if you're interested in volunteering with public health and getting to be part of some of these exercises or um, actually working alongside of us uh, during responses where we might have a pod activated or events throughout the community where we need vaccinators or we need community members that are talking um, with people coming in. So we have both medical and non-medical roles within the MRC. Um, so if you're interested in that, I highly recommend you look into it. So one thing I wanted to mention, um, this is not done through public health, but it's something to keep in mind, um, is that during a declaration, during an emergency, um, oftentimes people need to leave their homes right away. Um, leaving behind their medications. Uh, and so there is a program called the Emergency Prescription Assistance Program or EPAP. Um, when there's a declaration of an emergency, whether it's a fire or flood, tornadoes, um, anything along that line, the EP EPAP program is activated and they can work with over 72,000 um, pharmacies in order to get access to prescriptions or medical grade equipment that's been prescribed to you. Um, they generally can provide you with a free 30 day supply. Um, however, I would um, in any way check with your, um, your, in your health insurance companies, Medicare, um, private insurances. Generally when there's some sort of disaster, um, they have the ability to, to work with you in order to um, help you get access to those medications or medical grade equipment. So always start with your insurance companies, but during large scale incidents um, where there's evacuations or people are needing to leave their homes, their areas for whatever reason, um, EPAP does exist to assist with that. And I know this has already been touched on several times, um, but ready.gov really is a great resource. <laughs> As it's been um, we, we like to use it um, when community members are kind of asking us, um, like, how do we create our own plans? Um, Cause the, you know, they'll, we'll get people that ask us, well, can we get copies of your plans? It's like, it's, our plans are to serve the entire county, um, all the residents, everybody. With ready.com, that's a, a program that's available with resources that serve you, specifically you and your family. And they have all sorts of resources for children, um, for elder adults, uh, anything. They've got several different languages. Um, so I definitely highly recommend looking at ready.gov if you don't have your own um, personal emergency plan um, or resource kit, um, things like that. So I would definitely utilize, save that resource and go check it out. Uh, so if you have any questions um, related to healthcare concerns, um, vaccine, anything like that, we actually have our own call center that we call the care center. That seems to be a theme today. Um, and it, uh, they basically are kind of the brain of public health. They take all the information in and they have all the resources to provide out to direct um, people that call in um, with health related or sometimes not health related um, questions. Um, so they, they actually formed during COVID. We're really thankful to have them because without them, it's, it's really hard to 
get the information you need and get to the right resources. Um, so they're, they're the go-to they're available Monday through Friday. Um, and they can do different languages. Um, and they also have for hard of hearing the TTY line. Um, they're trained in that. Uh, so definitely if you've got any questions or if there's anything, um, that you're concerned about, chances are they're going to be able to get you to the right source. Um, and also I know it's been mentioned the heat, um, the heat and the cooling centers. Um, I just checked and it looks like the heat relief site network, their map, the interactive map that shows everything, um, will be live again on May first. So that's coming up. So you'll actually be able to search the different, um, cooling centers, respite centers, um, that are available all throughout the County. Uh, it does appear that the list has expanded. Um, and there's also information, um, on the heat networks, um, website that shows how you can also be one of those resources listed so that people can go when they need to cool down.